My name is Ed Valencia. I'm the Director of Safety and Training for LPR Construction. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Brian McClure. He is our training manager. Uh, he's been in the industry for 20 years. Um, he's been an iron worker connector for us and uh, crane operator, general foreman, and now our training manager. Uh, but he's been with LPR for 18 years. Uh, he's really took our training program to uh, levels that I don't think we've ever could have reached without the way he thinks uh, with the younger generation. So I think this is perfect for him to be putting this on. So with that, uh, Brian. I know you guys are thinking you're a uh, whoa. You're thinking I'm really loud and sound like Mickey Mouse. You're looking at me, you know, usually when I give this talk, I go get in front of a bunch of people and, and uh, they have no idea what Ironworks is about, right? And, uh, you know, somebody introduced me as a former connector and you know, people are like, oh yeah, he looks like a connector, you know? They have no idea, right? And you guys are going, that fat kid never connected a day in his life. But I promise you, I used to be a little bit skinnier than this when I worked for a living and, and uh, you know, I did actually connect. So like Ed said, I'm, I'm a third generation iron worker. Uh, my father, uh, grandfather were both iron workers and, and uh, you know, I didn't mean to get into the trade and iron works one of those things that kind of, you know, picks you and you don't pick it. So. So today uh, we're going to go through, you know, how to set up an effective training program, some new stuff, uh, maybe you can take away uh, as far as new tricks to reach a younger generation. Iron work is um, inherently a young man's sport. You know, you don't see a lot of uh, 16, 7 year olds just breaking into the trades as a level one apprentice. And so uh, more and more um, we're having to reach out and, and, uh, and try and teach these guys in different ways, ways that they uh, have grown up. Uh, learning in schools and whatnot. So we're gonna talk about training design, how do you deliver some quality training, uh, how to incorporate competition, camaraderie into your uh, training session. How many of you are still records in here? All right, so almost all of you, you're my peeps and I like this. I can, I can almost talk iron worker language here, right? I was like, no, no you can't. So first thing first, uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun today. We, um, uh, you all have clickers in front of you provided uh, by uh, turning technologies. We're going to do a little game and uh, uh, you know answer some questions throughout and then we got some nice uh, prizes, we got some t-shirts, got some water bottles we can send you away with you know if your team wins. So on this next slide I'm going to bring up I need to break you up into groups so if everyone could um, you know we'll call this these first three tables right here we're going to call that uh, group one actually the first two tables group one that second table or that third table right here, we're going to make you group three. So when this light comes up, if you could just uh, click on number three. These two tables would be uh, team four. Team five back here, uh, the, the people they're hiding for. I always uh, try and get in the back, you know. This would be uh, team six, these two tables. Seven. And you two guys are going to be eight. So if eight wins, then we're going to give it to the next higher point total because eight doesn't count right <laughs> all right so give it a second here if you could all press the team numbers that I just uh, assigned you everyone get it all right so we got a proportionally uh, larger amount of people in group three six and seven but that's all right hopefully you don't win because I don't have that many gifts I, I do have enough, but <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. Ed's got plenty of stuff to give out, so. Yeah. All right, let's have some fun. Give you about 60 seconds. I want you to memorize those 15 digits. See the smoke coming out of your ears. Another ten seconds. All right. So the way the game works, as we're moving through this today, uh, it's all fastest responders. So team one, if you uh, pick the correct answer first before anyone else then you're going to get the most points. Anyone from in your team, right? 
So that being said, what was the correct answer? Twenty-five, twenty-six. Is that everyone? All right. The correct answer was three. Team one. Man, you guys, uh, look at you. You got it first before everyone else. So, how did you uh, memorize those numbers? Anyone, team one? Right? Made up a saying. That's good. And that is, so the dig, that's called the digit span test. The most uh, numbers an average person can memorize at once without error is, is seven, and we're going to get into that. And this is part of uh, what we call a deliberate practice. It's one principle of deliberate practice. It's the chess method. Um, and so when we teach students things, uh, we try and give them a lot of information, and then we want them to be able to recall it later when it's really important to them. Uh, and when you're doing that, uh, you've got to group information together. That's the way our brains work, right? We have to lump things together for recall later. The way they do it in chess, or one way they do it in chess, is they memorize openings, attacks, defenses of great chess masters. And Because chess is complicated, right? There's lots, lots and lots of moves. And for them to recall that later, they have to group all that information into attacks, defenses, and, and offenses. So if I gave you this information like this, I would it make it easier for you. Well, if I told you the CEO was originally founded in 1972, that was your first four numbers in that digit span. Currently has 216 members. Eddie Williams, who I don't see in here, but I uh, saw him last night, love that guy, was the first president of CEO. On average, an iron worker carries 60 pounds of tools and bolts every day. I think that's a little light, but I'm carrying like 260 pounds of stuff without even being tools on, so uh, I know what you're thinking. There's no way you weigh 260. You look like 185, but <laughs> I, I do. The One World Trade Center, it's also known as the Freedom Tower, is going to be the tallest steel structure in the United States when it's completed. It's going to be 1,776 feet tall. And then finally, again, the average digit span that a person can memorize is seven. So if I gave you that information like that, you think you could uh, uh, submit it to memory and, and recall it later? Who wants to volunteer? I got something nice just for volunteering. Come on up. You got to come up here, though. No, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just tell us the numbers. Okay. Oh, the, the, the numbers? No, go ahead and do it though, the way you're doing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> two, 211 members? 216. Okay. Close. Um, uh, Eddie Williams was the first person of CIA. Yep. 60 pounds of tools. Yep, yep. Yes. Seven, seven. Seven. See, she's already working in a team, right? We're building the camaraderie already. So, what do you think? Should we give it to her? I think we should, right? That was good. Can you catch? I don't want to hit you in the face. I did this before, and it didn't turn out so well. There we go. All right, so 1972, 216 members. Eddie was the first president, 60 pounds of tools. The Freedom Tower is going to be 1,776 feet tall, and there's average of seven without fair. So they've gotten up to over 100 numbers in a row. And these, when, when they're testing people for this, and they, and they think it's an intelligence test, it's really not that, they, uh, they'll keep stringing numbers together. I can't remember the guy's name, but he was using, he was a runner. And so he was equating all the numbers that they were giving to him randomly back to his running times and making it string it out like that. Amazing. This is a favorite quote of mine. 
I, uh, I often wonder, you know, if you were to uh, replace the end of this with into the office with going into the classroom and training, how much of that would be true for a lot of us. I know personally I've sat in a lot of uh, training sessions and classroom settings where you get in there and, and there's no interaction. It's just someone speaking at you and you're supposed to absorb everything, right? So it's not really that difficult, though. Uh, this is LPR University is what we call our training program. We got a, a campus in Loveland that has, you know, two buildings: one for welding, one for classroom training, and then we got a 22-ton training tower for teaching all of our uh, new hires and whatnot. And then there's really, you know, four basic elements of of training. You got to design the training, right? A, a poorly designed plan is not going to go off good for anyone. And then you've got to execute the training. And the best plan, laid plan, can be messed up by putting someone in front of a group of guys that uh, they don't have any faith in. They don't, they don't believe in what he says. He doesn't have any street cred, right? So we wouldn't take a uh, plumber to teach ironworker classes. And then he's also got to be able to, um, you know, verbally get his point across to the students. So we need design. You need execution. And then the the, the people in the, in the field, they need to be able to replicate that skill soon after they've learned it. So if you teach someone to connect uh, in June and they don't use that skill again until December, they're probably not going to remember a lot of it, right? Even though it's hands-on, there's going to be a higher retention rate. You know, it's not going to stick. And then finally, the, f the fourth one, I said there was four, is you got to have buy-in from all the mentors, the supervisors on the job site. And the way you get that is you have them in the design process of the training program so that they have a vested interest in this going off well in the field. This is what we call our attributes of success. This is our uh, vision statement for our training department to provide our employees with the mentoring and training that they're going to need to be the future face of our company. Simple stuff, but it's very true. Every time someone comes into our classroom, uh, we, we give them as much training and treat them as equals as, as anyone. And all of our employees go through training. We don't, we don't pick and choose. Every single person, uh, when they hire on with us, they either have their NCCR certification or they are in training to, to obtain it. Right? And then even when they get it, we have what's called upgrade training. And so people get it across the board. Sometimes unwillingly, most of the time they enjoy it though by the, by the end of time. So this is what we call our secret sauce, our four C's. Commitment, camaraderie, competition, consistency. The commitment part, this ties back into our company's core values. Now every company's got a mission statement, it's got a list of core values. Ours happen to come from, uh, we got all of our supervisors and our employees together in a big banquet. And we had them get in groups and write down what makes LPR different, special uh, from any other company you worked at or, or, or whatnot. And this is what we came up with. Uh, so whenever we design training, we design it with the thought in mind that we're going to try and tie that to every one of these things, what makes LPR special. Camaraderie, this is a big one for us. So, you know, similar to what we did here this morning, when someone comes to our class, apprentices, uh, we break them up into teams. Uh, and that's the very first thing we do. And then we tell them, you know, hey, you're going to get some rewards if your team wins. And you would not believe what these guys will do to win a t-shirt. You know, it's amazing. And so this is a picture from our new hire training class. Every time we hire um, new hires, we'll do it in groups and blocks. And we'll put them through two weeks of, we call it boot camp, uh, at the home office in our campus. And they'll be on our training tower. They'll be in the welding shop, practicing to weld. Uh, and they're going to go through that, they're going to get their OSHA 10, all in the first two weeks, right? And we have a lot of guys wash out during that time period because not everyone's made to be an iron worker, right? We're not teaching guys to be plumbers, which I think I can talk about plumbers in this room now, right? We're all steel erectors. <laughs> I have to say something else, like IT guy or something. No offense, IT guys. But um, so we bring them in there, we break them up in teams, and for two weeks all they do is they, they build their team together, they work together, every task we give them, is focused on you're only as strong as your weakest link and the instructors we usually have four to six instructors they'll find your weakest link right and what we found is that uh, when we do that in the classroom and the hands-on training that that's going to perpetuate itself into the field even you know here recently we we started a job in alabama and uh, we had to send one apprentice out there and he said man i don't i don't want to go can i go with you know this guy and this guy and this guy and they're all guys that he was on his team with during his boot camp time, you know, during the two weeks that he was in our office. And so it's kind of like a built-in support system, right? They send them together on the field, and they're getting mentoring from above, but they're also getting lateral uh, mentoring 
from the guys that they created this bond with during their uh, time. And I think anyone that's been in the service, if you go through boot camp, the guys and the relationships you build in the actual boot camp, you know, you carry those through. I mean, I've heard it numerous times. And this camaraderie is going to work hand in hand with competition. So uh, when we use this to teach people, you can't get people to assimilate information as fast as if you incorporate uh, competition into it. Right? I mean, Americans, we are all about competition. We love competition. We'll do anything to win. And so uh, we do this, and, and these, the amount of retention that these guys get just by competing against each other and uh, wanting to win is amazing. And then the last one is consistency. So consistency for us is big. We use NCCR's um, curriculum. Jennifer Wilkinson, she's got a booth out there in the trade show. If you're not using it, you should go check her out. They've got great, great curriculum. And what NCCR has enabled us to do is, is to uh, certify all of our instructors using the same uh, ICTP instructor certification training program uh, manual and, and training program across the board. So we take iron workers who are inherently not, not teachers, right? And we uh, train them to be teachers. You know, and it's not an easy thing. I, I was an iron worker. You know, getting up in front of people and speaking was not a natural leap for me. That took a lot of work. And, and so we train them all to do that and how to open up and how to get their point across and how to design training. And then we give them all, all of our students portable credentials. That's a big one. Everyone, like I said, everyone that works for LPR, you either have your NCCR credentials or you're in training to get them. When you get those credentials, uh, you, can, you can take them anywhere and work for anyone that recognizes NCCR credentials. And so that's not something we keep internally. That's a benefit that we give our employees. And then the biggest thing here is uh, site management report. Like I said, all this, you can do everything in the world, teach the best class, uh, have the best students. But if you know, what you're doing in the classroom doesn't translate to the field and the guys in the field aren't supporting what you're doing in the classroom, it's all for naught. Right? I mean, it's, if I'm telling them one thing and the guys feel say, oh, that's just how they do it up in, up in Loveland, then it's, it's a failed program. So, like I said, the components are easy. It's really easy. Design, you want your delivery. From that delivery, you want to get them out there and you want to execute it, get some hands-on training involved with the, that follows up with the classroom training. We all know that, you know, as iron workers, we like getting out and doing stuff. We're kinesthetic. We like getting our hands on stuff, tactile. And then finally, they've got to take that skill and they've got to be able to execute it in the field. We call that just-in-time training. Uh, we're doing a uh, training program here, coming up a connector training program. We're bringing in uh, the raising game form and the two connectors, and we're going to have them work together as a team on our training tower. And then we're also doing some mock-ups of what they're going to find out on that jo particular job site in Orlando. And we're going to do that you know, two weeks before they go to the job site. So everything that we teach them in there is going to transfer right over. And part of that design process was the superintendent. He's telling us, here's my top ten things I want you to train these guys. And we all know about connecting. Teach them about double connections. Teach them to keep their fingers out of the way. Teach them how to use their tools. Teach them how to climb columns if they need to, right? So those are the, are the givens. But every foreman's got his list of stuff that, man, I wish, you know, if they would just train this one thing, it would make my life easier. So we incorporate their, their hit list into our training program and then... We send them out to the field with that, and then we, you know, at the end of it, we follow up. How do we do? Here's a good video of how not to do your training. Your hands on, although it's pretty funny. Sorry. Smell anything smoky? Did you bring your jerky in again? If 
was warming. <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> Don't you love doing training exercise like that? I would give anything to be able to do that. Our safety guys are... No. So, uh, I love The Office. My, my wife and my kids, we watch it every Thursday night. You know, that's like a, a staple for us watching it. So let's talk about training design. So there's some questions you want to ask when, when you're getting ready to do a training session with your, your, your students. How difficult is the task? Does the task have to be done in a standardized manner? And how frequent is that person going to replicate this task in the field? Right? And that's all important because this is going to speak directly to um, you know, how much effort and the training design you put into it. If it's something simple, we could probably plug in a, in a, a videotape or a, a DVD right? and let them watch out for 15 minutes and, and that's fine. But if it's something difficult that uh, you know, could be dangerous and they're probably not going to do it a lot of times, we probably want to give them some excellent training. This guy obviously didn't go to LPR University. so. So what we use um, is a new tool that I, I just started getting from uh, the training clinic. Uh, great, great bunch of people. They have a lot of great resources. And, and this tool helps you uh, to decide, you know, how, how serious this training need to be. And so I like to use the example of a crane operator that is using a personnel basket, right? You're flying people up in a basket. That's a pretty dangerous activity. You know, the operator's got to be good. He's got to be well trained. And it's not something that we do all the time. OSHA says that's the, uh, the least preferred way of getting people up onto the building or, or whatnot, right? And so you start asking your, yourself some questions. How difficult is the, is the task? For me, uh, flying people in a basket, dealing with human lives directly under your hook, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty hard, right? It's different, you know, if you bang some, a tree of iron off the walls, that's not going to do anything other than you know, upset some people. But if you bang some people off some walls, that's going to that's gonna be even worse. It is important that the task be done in a standardized manner, absolutely. OSHA has laid out some very specific things we have to do for using personnel baskets, right? 
you know, we have to fill out the pre-test, the pre-lift, we got to inspect the rigging, can't use more than 50% of the cranes charts. The rigging used for the basket can only be used for that basket. So there's a very standardized manner in which this task has to be done. And then how frequently will the task be repeated? Well, in this case, 9 times out of 10, you're not going to be using that as your only means of accessing. So crane operators do this infrequently, right? This isn't an everyday task form. So that leads us to advanced training. If you come down here to the bottom, it says, okay, advanced training. The learner must be trained at a, to a high standard of retention. You're going to accomplish this by reinforcing the training, giving them re resources, references, and or job aids. Captain Sully, uh, the pilot that landed the um, plane on the Hudson, right? Did you know that he landed that plane on the Hudson by using a job aid? I didn't know that until recently. He, uh, you know, it was 126 seconds from the time he took off. And then he lost his, or from the time he lost his engines until we put it in the water. And you know those first uh, 20 seconds were like, oh crap, oh crap, lost both my engines. Now what do I do? Hey, tower, I lost my engines. What do I do? The next 100 seconds, he flipped to a job aid that he had inside of his aircraft, flipped to the right page, told him, you know, here you got a situation. You don't have any engines, no thrust, uh, no control of the power to the plane. And this is what you do. You got to set your rudders here. You got to set your, you know, flaps here. And he used that job aid to get everything set in the correct way to land it on the Hudson. I didn't know that. That blew my mind that there was a job aid that well designed that, you know, you got all these people lives in the back of the plane and you lost all your power. And he has enough sense and well trained to flip to the right part of the job aid and look at it, get everything set and land that thing. That was, uh, that blew my mind. So we use this when we're trying to design training for our people. Uh, especially, you know, for the more important tasks where we know they're very important. Connecting training, that's a big one for us. That's one of the, inherently the most dangerous things we do, right? So this guy, he didn't go to LPR University either. Also not an LPR crane. Ed, Ed likes me to say that stuff. <laughs> so this guy, uh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't go through the diff tree with him, see uh, what kind of training he should have had. So now we're going to get a little bit, a little more into the train design. This is a favorite quote of mine, Duke Snyder. He was a uh, baseball player for the LA Dodgers. And he says, what a player does best, he should practice at least, practice for problems. And that inherently uh, is not something we want to do. It's human nature to want to work on the stuff you're good at, right? Like I'm good at shooting free throws. I'm going to shoot free throws all day long because it makes me feel good. I don't want to work on the stuff that I'm not good at. You know, I'm the same way. I'm good at uh, walking places. You could tell I don't practice on the running part, and that's the part I need to practice on a little bit more, right? That's where you can laugh. You can laugh at my fat jokes. It's, it's, a, it's for your entertainment. <laughs> so deliberate practice. This is something that is a common thread that runs through all of our training programs at LPR. Deliberate practice is um, you're taking a skill, and you're trying to replicate what they're going to be doing in the field as closely as you can in their training environment. And then when you're doing that, you're taking this person out of their comfort zone. There's no growth that happens in a comfort, uh, zone of comfort, right? You have your comfort zone, you have your proficiency zone, and then you have your uncomfortable zone, and that's where everything, where everyone grows. So for us, you see one of our apprentices here climbing columns. This is not uh, something that comes naturally. It has to be trained. We have some guys that are monkeys that can do it pretty well, but everyone can use some technique and some training during this. So different types of deliberate practice. We already did one, the chest method. We did one form of that when we did the digit span test at the beginning, right? We uh, clumped information together for recall later, just like, what's your name? Anna. Anna, just like Anna said. It's inherently, we know it in the back of our head, uh, but it's something you gotta bring to your forethought when you're teaching and you're training, you're, you're designing your training sessions. Another method for chess is a case study. Uh, it's great to use case studies for uh, safety classes and do a safety training. You know, here's an accident. It's before it you know, happens. What would you do? My son likes to read these um, choose your own adventure books. Well, they're using these choose your own adventure books to teach kids uh, what to do in emergency situations now. Like he just read one that was about natural disasters. And then, you know, you, you read through the book and it says a tornado is coming to you. Uh, what do you do? Uh, you can stay in your car. You can get out in a low lying ditch or you can go grab a tree, you know. And so, you kind of pick your way through the book. If you pick the wrong answer, you're dead. And so uh, these case study methods, they're great for training, and it keeps people entertained. That's a whole part of this whole thing. Keep them entertained so they like to learn. 
musical method uh, used by many famous musicians, Bach, Beethoven, Britney Spears. They, uh, <laughs> they use this, uh, they'll take a skill that there's going to be very repetitive and they'll perform it over and over and over, right? And then in between each, each time they perform the skill, they're going to have a mentor or an instructor giving them exacting feedback uh, right at the end of it. Tell them, you know, this is, that was good, but you could have done this better, or so on, so on and so forth. With iron work, you know, this isn't as common. We don't have that many repetitive tasks. If I had to pick one, it would be um, bolt up. You know, even though that's, that's, that's pushing it, decking, throwing decking, that can get kind of repetitive. Um, but the whole point is, you know, teach them something, have them teach it back to you, you give them exacting feedback. And then finally, the sports method. This is my favorite method. Uh, this is, you know, just like a quarterback. A quarterback can take snaps, and he sits back, and he drops. You see these guys in the combine all the time. They're the best quarterback in the whole combine. They can run, they can throw, they can jump. They get to the football field, they can't do any of that stuff under pressure, right? And so using the sports method, you take that skill, and you try to put them out in that environment when you're training them, or after you've trained them, and see if they can replicate it under pressure, uh, out, of, out of position, uncomfortable circumstances, just like they're going to have in the job site. I got a little, little bit of a proud father moment here. That was uh, my son and I. We won the uh, division, or we, we took second. I'm sorry. I wish we won. That's why he's crying. You can see the tears in his eyes. We took second in the Division III uh, state football championships this year, right? And that happened because three years ago, when he was a little guy, uh, he was the first time playing quarterback. My son never played quarterback before. He was always linebacker. And... I worked with him all summer, all summer long. We were taking snaps, I'm smacking up into his hands. He's doing a three-step drop, you know, five-step drop, seven-step drop, making reads, you know, throwing to different, you know, friends in the neighborhood that he was practicing on. He could throw a beautiful pass, right? And uh, under pressure, he had the cadence, had everything. We got to our game, and I realized I made a pretty significant flaw in the last three months training him how to throw the football is that uh, our offense line doesn't block. <laughs> All these guys in yellow, that's all his linemen. They're all looking at the guys that were supposed to block, tackling my son as he's throwing the ball. So this was a disaster, the, uh, the first two or three games. And it really took me a lot. You know, and this is when I first became uh, introduced to deliberate practice to uh, get him to break some habits. He would drop back there, and it was just like he had all the time in the world. He thought he could just open up and throw. And he never dropped back once without having a guy in his face. And so we started to change up the way we were coaching him. Uh, I'd have him start dropping back. And then I'd have a defensive end. I'd let him go unblocked at him right away. And so he's getting chased all over the field. And he's having to throw without his feet set on the run, trying to be accurate with broken patterns. Coming out of these little league guys, they don't run good crisp patterns, right? And so long story short, you know, after doing all that and, and him getting beat up in practice a whole bunch, and the, the defensive ends loved it. They got a free ride at the quarterback, you know, during practice. So they, they loved doing this. But uh, this was his first completed pass. He dropped back. He rolled out. He's got four guys in his face right there. You can see this guy, he's right in his face. He got the ball off early. It wasn't, wasn't perfect, it wasn't beautiful. But there he is right there getting clobbered. But long story short, I wouldn't put it up here if he didn't complete the pass. And you know, I was a proud, proud dad at that moment. And that was all because, you know, leading up to that, we put him in those circumstances, had him rolling out, thrown under pressure. Nothing's perfect. Don't try and do everything perfect in practice. So how do we do that in ironwork? This is typically how guys learn to weld, right? In our shop, they set up nice and perfect. They got ventilation. They've got their uh, plates right in front of them. Ideal welding environment. They don't have their uh, sleeves. We give them sleeves, we give them gloves. It's perfect, air conditioned, it's, it's perfect. And then we go out, send them out to the field and I get calls from the general foreman. This guy can't weld to save his life. How did you certify this guy? I was like, oh, man. when he was in the shop, he was the best welder I ever saw. It was a stack of dimes going up that plate. And so to incorporate that in the shop, we started doing things like this. We built a moment welding simulator. So we were having a lot of problems with guys that could weld you know, and certify, but we weren't replicating the circumstance they were going to have in the field. And so this is Ricky Zaski. He's one of our welding instructors. He built this um, simulator in our shop. We got a bunch of columns and and still work inside of a welding uh, training center. And, and he's built these uh, moment simulators with these plates in there. You know, the only consumer we have is a plate. And he's got a backer there. And so guys learn to weld out of position. They're getting burnt. They're uncomfortable. And we can move this thing. We've got you know, four or five different positions we can put this beam in. 
to try and simulate what they're going to find in the field. Our next step, um, we haven't built it yet, is a K brace or tube steel braces. You know, guys are always trying to weld an inverted vertical going up. That's, that's a tough one to do. Doing overheads hard, doing verticals hard, doing an inverted vertical, that's even harder, right? And so we've had great success with this. You know, Ricky will take and he'll demonstrate to the students, show them what they're doing, and then have them practice it back, and they'll do this all day long. And then we'll cut up their plates and we'll see, do you have any inclusions in there? Is it a good solid weld? You know, helps out tremendously. And that's how we incorporate our deliberate practicing as far, as far as welding is concerned. There's a picture over there, you can kind of see how our, our setup looks. As far as safety training, so uh, you get on a job site and any more uh, owners, contractors, they want things done faster, they want it done cheaper, they want it done with less people, and all that's doing is putting a lot of pressure on our people to, and that trickulates down all the way to the lowest bolt-up hands, right? And so typically what the first thing that goes out the window is, is, is safety, and soon behind it, quality. Guys trying to take shortcuts, they're under a lot of pressure. I gotta get 500 bolts a day, try and keep schedule, this and that, right? And so what we try and do is, uh, in our training, we try and give them the same kind of circumstances. When we bring them in for their, their uh, two-week new hire class, or boot camp, we'll bring them in and we'll give them goals for each one of their teams. And the, the goals are, they're achievable, but they're nearly impossible, right? And so they're just within their reach, but only you know, if everything goes just right. And then with those goals, we're going to be putting pressure on them. they got instructors the whole time in their ear, chattering at them the whole time, like drill instructors. Come on, hurry up, get it done. You know, general foreman in the field, iron for general foreman the same way. They're going to yell at them all day long to do better, move faster. And then at the end of it, we're going to give them a significant reward. You know, and so in the training sessions, we have, uh, in our, at the end of our two-week period, what we call the top team. It's like top gun, right, but it's our top team. And those guys get a plaque, and they get a picture of them and all their uh, classmates. And you know, for the rest of time, they're going to be known as the, the two-man group that was the top team because we break them up in two-man groups. And so we feel like this, this definitely helps us in the area of safety uh, as far as, you know, I, when you're under that much pressure and you still got to obey all the rules, that's a whole different set of circumstances. I went to a master rigor course uh, in ITI with Mike Parnell in Washington before. And all week long, we learn rigging stuff. They break us into teams. And at the end of the week, we have a, a master rigger rodeo. Right, and the winner of that, the team, the team that wins that gets gold belt buckles. And so we went up there, and uh, I had this young guy with me, and the whole time I had to listen to this guy. Man, he was good at math too. Man, you're gonna be polishing my gold belt buckle on the plane right home, man. You're, you know, all week long I'm here, and his all week long his team was just wrecking mine in all the little competitions we had. Right, so we get to the rodeo end of the week, and you've got to go through all these events. They're all timed, and then you got instructors watching everything you do, taking notes down. And we get to the rodeo, we didn't finish all of our events, my team didn't. We were two events short. His team was the only team that finished all the events. So we get to the end and he's giving it to me. I mean, just laying into me the whole time with the awards presentation. You know, and the guy got up there, uh, awarded the gold belt buckle, he said, you know, and he called my team. And I swear to God, the guy was my witness, but the guy that was with me, he was standing up ready to take his gold belt buckle. And he didn't give it to him. And he gave it to my team because we were methodical the way we moved through all the, all the uh, course. They didn't tell us that they weren't grading us on only our skills. They were placing a higher priority on how were we doing everything safe. Were we working together as a team and pre-planning and all that other stuff, which we were doing, and which is the reason we didn't finish the course. Come to find out, most people don't finish the course if they do all their pre-planning for all the lists. And so, yeah, he was polishing my belt buckle on the way home. It was great. All right. So... Next part of this, we're going to talk about training the Google generation, what I call them, they're the LinkedIn generation. LinkedIn generation. Everyone has a 3x5 card in front of them. I want to give you about three minutes. I want you to get with your team. And I want you to write down as many words as you can think of describing the younger generation coming into the workforce. Uh, be brutally honest. We're not going to ask you to read your own answers. We're going to shuffle these all around. And then we're going to read them out loud uh, afterwards. But be as, as honest as you can and write down exactly you know, some good descriptive words about the new younger, younger generation. Give you uh, three minutes.
Yeah, about another another one minute. He's having that thing right there. You gotta walk in front of it. You can't walk around, you know. Twenty minutes. Hmm? Oh, we got twenty minutes left. We got twenty minutes left. Yep. Oh yeah. Everyone get their uh, words written down? Okay, now I want you to uh, pass your card to anyone, I don't care who, someone not on your team. And now when you get that card from another team, I want you to pass it one more time. So we're passing it a total of three times, pass them around. All right, let's hear, uh, shout out some of the words you have there. Anyone? Smart. Smart. Lazy. Lazy, I like that one. What else? Unmotivated. Unmotivated. Texters. Texters, yeah, exactly. All the time. Thin skin. Poor work ethic. Distracted. Distracted. Entitled. Entitled. That's a big one, right? We hear that all the time. Short-sighted. They're not looking at the big picture. They're, it's a whiff them. What's in it for me? Right? Sensitive. Say that again? Sensitive. Sensitive, right? Well, a lot of them wear eyeliner and these skinny jeans. I would be sensitive if I was, <laughs> you know. I would be sensitive too. Lack of discipline. Lack of discipline. Impatient. Impatient. Want everything right now, right? Immediate gratification. Unsafe. Unsafe. Yeah. What else? Thin skin. Thin skin. Very sensitive. All right, your list sounds a lot like my list. I have my own list here. They have bad attitudes, right? They come into work. They're, uh, they feel like you own the world. They don't really care what you think. They feel like you're, they're doing you a favor by working for you. They're not team players. The baby boomer generation was the greatest group of team players we've ever had, right? And then you start getting into my generation, the younger generation, and, and it's all about... You know, give me something, let me do it, and leave me alone. Constantly complaining. Always complaining. Gossipy. Lazy. Apathetic. Rude. And disloyal. Does my list sound a lot like you guys' list? It does, right? We're all kind of feeling the same thing. Yeah. I disagree with you. Which one? All of them. All of them? All right. That's good, because my list... It was not describing that generation, it was describing the baby boomer generation. This came out of Life magazine in 1968. It was describing uh, our baby boomers, They're right? <laughs> this is what the traditionals said about uh, a lot of the people that's in this room right now. A lot of the same things we're saying about the new generation, right? And they're saying you're bad attitude, you're not team players, you're constantly complaining, you're gossip, you're lazy, apathetic, right? 
Same stuff we're saying about the new generation coming into the workforce. So what we're really describing here is not the newer generation. We're describing a youthful generation. They have different life experiences than we do. They don't have everything that you have getting you to this point, right? If we can say the same thing about one of the greatest generations we ever had, the baby boomers, who is the backbone of our workforce right now and who's leaving, going to leave us uh, high and dry here pretty quick, then, you know, the stuff we're saying about all the new generation, it doesn't really ring true. I mean, some of it does. Some of it, like, uh, you know, being digitally literate, computer literate, that's all they've known. They're going to be more computer literate than a lot of us, right? So, traditionals. Uh, you were born before 1945, baby boomers, 1946, 1964. This is the spokesperson for the baby boomer movement. I just thought I'd throw it up there. Uh, that was Ed about 10 years ago, where he cleaned up. Generation X, this is my generation. They call this the latchkey generation, right? Because all the baby boomers went to work. Both parents were working. We'd come home from school, and there was no parents there to tell us what to do. And so they'd leave us a list of stuff. That list of stuff we would take. You know, we had as much time to get it as long as it was done before our parents got home. But we had to get that list done, right? And that has transferred over to the workplace, too. We're the generation of, you know, don't hold my hand. Don't walk me through stuff. Tell me what you want and let me get it done. I'll get it done, right? Which is opposed to the baby boomers, who I, they are the greatest team players there are. They're all about team. They even call their coworkers family. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. And so there, there's a big discrepancy there between our generations just because of the generational signposts. Generation Y, they're the generation, they've usually got the same parents as Generation X. What happens if baby boomers got married, had kids, got divorced, remarried, had more kids, right? And that's Generation Y. And then all of a sudden, when they had more kids, they wanted to create more of a family environment again. And so the Generation Y, is, they're big into family. And then we got our new generation, the Langster generation. They call them all different stuff. Google generation, Langster generation, millenniums whatever you want to call them. These guys are going to be in the workforce starting in 2013. Real quick, I'll do a quick survey. Uh, I can't track it back to who you are. So on your, uh, on your little uh, clickers there, click uh, what generation you belong to. Twenty-five responses, I think that's about all. All right, and just like what's in the, the workforce nowadays, this is a good snapshot of what we got going on. 44% of you in here are baby boomers. Now, the baby boomers, a lot of you probably would already left the workforce and retire if it wasn't for the recent recession, right? Now, they're going to stick around a little bit longer, buying us some more times. But when this group of people leaves the workforce, we're in a lot of trouble because this group of people, they like to work with their hands. They're hardworking. They didn't see working with your hands and doing construction as demeaning. And the newer generations coming in, they tend to see that. They want to get into computers, you know, and, and, and they're, it's not being promoted enough working in the, in the trades. The average student who graduates high school has spent 10,000 hours playing computer games and only 5,000 hours reading books. That's amazing. It's an amazing stat. But that stat is something that, uh, as trainers, we need to incorporate into what we're doing every day. Our, our kids aren't coming in here and learning by reading books, right, or going to lectures. They're learning from playing games, internet, stuff like that. Today's students, everything they want, they get it at the click of the mouse. So I call them the Google generation. Anything you want to know, you click on Google, type it in, and it'll, you'll find it. They have a wealth, wealth of information. They have a demand for immediate answers. This is transferred over because, uh, as opposed to our generations, where you had to go and look up books in the Dewey Decimal System, or using Encyclopedia Britannica's, and it was, it was a little laborious finding answers about stuff. They can just click on Google and find all the answers they want. It might be the wrong answers, you know, if you go to Wikipedia or something, but they can get all the information they want. And so this has resulted in, a, in them needing to be entertained. They learn through gaming. I go to my son's school, and to learn math, they got all kinds of math games and stuff, which I love. I think it's great. I don't care how he learns as long as he learns it. But it's also led us to a problem of long-term retention. Because they have so much access to so much information, they have no reason to commit that to memory, as opposed to us where we had to go look stuff up, the Dewey Decimal System, and Encyclopedia Britannica and stuff. You know, that was laborious. There was a reason for us to tuck that back away somewhere and, and use it later. For them, they Google everything. 
They text everything. Their phones, they all have smartphones. They want an answer, they get it immediately right out of their phone. We never had those options when we were kids. Okay, fastest responder, teams. like 67 percent of you thought it was in the five to six minute range i can see why you would think that the correct answer however was two it's 11 to 12 minutes it's the average amount of time between tv commercials as much as computers has affected our lives tv still dictates a lot of our the way we interact with the world right so we have this is cumulative now team seven you've now moved into the lead just uh, two tenths of a point above team one so uh keep the good work so what do we do as trainers? We got these kids coming in. They don't want to hear us talk. Uh, they don't want to read books. You sign them homework. The chance of them doing the homework is nil. Uh, giving them a chapter to read. Good luck with that, right? So what do we do? Edutainment is is something that's you're going to hear this catchphrase all over the place. I went to um, saw the top trainer for Disney the other day, and Disney calls this learnertainment. They've been doing it, of course, for like 20 years. You know, Disney is like the inventor and you know, perpetrator of everything that's good in the world. And so uh, this is what they do. They incorporate games into the learning experience, just like we're doing here today. We've all played a game throughout this whole thing, right? And, you know, it keeps you somewhat more interested than maybe you were before. Door of the Explorer. You know, when I was a kid, I learned my ABCs through a program called Sesame Street. That was edutainment. That was all through the TV, though, right? Nowadays, they got Dora Explorer. Learning Spanish as a second language, that is, that's a huge benefit. Anyone works in, a, in the construction workforce nowadays knows that if, you can, if you're bilingual, you are worth your weight in gold in what we do. And so that's, that's taking the place of the Sesame Streets of the world, right? This Math Blaster game, that's the game that my son plays. And, you know, he couldn't do fractions for the longest time. He was having a struggle with it. We get him this game, and he has no problem with fractions anymore. When you're, when you're teaching your classes, they need to be blended learning. So you need to... Uh, give that back to all the different types of learners there are. There's visual learners, there's auditory learners. Visual learners are going to learn best by seeing things, seeing videos, seeing movies, seeing demonstrations, things like that. Auditory, they're good at group discussions like this, listening to lectures. Tactile, which is most of our workforce, especially in construction trades, they need to be doing something hands-on. Show me how to do it, let me do it, and I'll learn it, right? The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Everyone get it? Okay, get your uh, get your clickers ready. Wow, look how fast responses are coming now. You guys are getting onto this. All right, survey says. Sixty-two percent of you think it was sixteen passes. Ooh, Team 7, look at that. Still in the lead, pulling away from everyone. Team 1, you're falling off. You're in third place now. Come on, Team 1. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again.
Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. So I put that video in there for everyone that says, I'm a visual learner. I got to see it, right? Well, what you want the visual learner to see and what they're actually seeing if they come in with preconceived notions might be two completely different things, right? How many, raise your hands, how many of you saw the gorilla? Be honest, please. Oh, yeah, so that's about right. About half of the people missed the gorilla. When I first saw it, completely missed the gorilla. No, I, and I, I, unbelievable, and I downloaded this video shortly after that because of that. With our safety program, what we do, you know, you see a safety guy. You got a safety guy designated to a job site. That safety guy is looking for certain things all day long. You know, he's got his list of stuff, but he's got certain hazards that are top on his list. And so he's walked to that site day in, day out, right, looking for safety hazards. What we've done is we've incorporated a safe uh, walk process where it's not just a safety guy doing the safety walk, but we'll bring different, we'll break the, the job site into teams. Right, this is big with us, teams, condition, camaraderie. We'll break them into teams, and then those teams will walk around the job site once a week, and they'll grade the other teams, parts of the work crews on the job site, for how they're doing. The team with the most points, and they're, they're nitpicky, way more nitpicky than our safety guys are. The teams that do the best at the end of the month, they get rewards from our safety department. And we got nice rewards. This guy's got all kinds of money. He gives these guys great things. So they, they will do anything they can to go over there and cut their buddy's throat about leaving some welding rods laying on the ground for quality or, you know, whatever it is. And that has helped us, that's, you know, spot the gorilla on our job sites. Because safety guys get conditioned. There's a designated safety guy, he's conditioned to look for certain things on the job site. This helps them to get separate sets of eyes walking through, checking stuff out. So when we're teaching, you always want to throw them a change up. You know, like I said, the average time span that if someone can pay attention to what you're doing is, you know, 11, 12 minutes. For us, Magic number is 10 minutes. When you're teaching class, you always want to change up what you're doing every 10 minutes, whether it be by video, interactive gaming, uh, doing a hands-on thing, having a group discussion. Every 10 minutes, try and change it up so people stay tuned in. All right, team seven, stand up, please. All right, come on up front here. Let's give them a round hand. <laughs> team seven's the winner, so you guys. You have your choices of t-shirts or water bottles? T-shirts, all right. What size are you? Extra large. There's a double X. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about me when I brought that one. Do <laughs> <laughs> have any larges? Are you I, I, could, I could wear a large. Unless you have Here's an extra large. Yo, find what size you wear. <laughs> <laughs> I go double X. You want double X? Yeah. All right. Double X. XL? Yep. All right. Thanks. Good job, guys. So and that's that's a microcosm of what we do throughout everything in OPR, you know, competition, camaraderie, consistency, you know. For our guys, those t-shirts, they wear them with the badge of pride, you know, on the job site, the LPR University's t-shirts. On the back, it has a, a picture of our training tower, you know, and that's something we're very proud of. And it's funny, we're, our, our students started their own Facebook page, LPR University, because a lot of them don't go to college, right? And so they started their own Facebook page so they can say they went to LPR University and whatnot. So it's kind of neat. This is a picture of our last class, um, the new art class, a rough bunch of guys, and and we have good retention rate out of this class, and they're all making us a lot better place, you know, moving forward. That's all I got. Any questions? How long does your apprenticeship class last? Just two weeks? No, no. That's just the uh, boot camp. So we have a three-year iron worker program. Um, the, the initial part, the boot camp, it's where it's almost strictly, uh, except for the OSHA 10 part of it, it's all hands-on. Teach them how to bolt up. Teach them uh, how to use their tools. What are their tools called? We string their belts together. You know, all this stuff that it's hard for a guy who's never been in that environment to, to learn in the field. So they go through that first two weeks, and then when we turn them out of the field, then they come back one Friday for eight hours every month, all the different levels. So we got level one, two, and three. And they do that whether they're in state in Colorado or out of state. We keep the classes going out of state. Every person we have uh, gets their classes no matter where they're at. And we have instructors like Travis Weber was. 
uh, our safety guy on the Florida Marlins project. He's also a former iron worker, and so we certified him as a instructor, and he taught classes on site at Marlins, and you know, same thing once a month. And what what we also do is this has helped us go into a local area and not have to transport all our people from Colorado. We can hire locally, and we'll do this training and get them up to speed faster, so they're more productive right out of the gate. Any other questions? All right, guys. Thank you.